Before I begin, be sure to like the video and leave a comment on what you think of it. Also, be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to keep up with further audiobook readings. Chapter 6 Ignorance We didn't know. The tour bus pulled up on Woodcrest. We'd all agreed we'd meet at my house because my street was the widest. My whole family assembled to see us off. Mom Mom, Daddy O, Gigi, Ellen, Harry. Pam was home now too, but Melanie said she couldn't bear to see me drive away. We had said our goodbyes the night before. The neighborhood kids had never seen a tour bus before, so they buzzed around, checking the tires, peering into the luggage bays, and talking to the driver. Somehow, Dana had done it. Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble lit up local radio in May 1986. Finally! When it first came out in March, it had stumbled, but by late May, it caught fire. We were hearing that it was getting played in Delaware, New Jersey, and even New York City. I graduated from high school in June, which meant I had an entire month as a senior with a hit record on the radio. That's too much power for one 17-year-old to have. As I ran off stage in my cap and gown, waving my diploma, I ran to hug Mom Mom, but she jokingly refused to hug me, snatched the diploma out of my hand, and said, Boy, this is mine! By July, Dana had me and Jeff locked in Studio 4 in downtown Philadelphia recording our debut album, Rock the House. Because Jeff and I had been making songs since the day we met, we finished the album at light speed. But Dana kept messing with the songs, remixing and re-engineering them, and ultimately ruining the production. Our relationship with him was already souring, but we didn't have time to focus on that. We had a hit song, and we had to figure out how to capitalize on it right now. We did a few shows up and down the East Coast with LL Cool J and Houdini, including a couple of sold-out gigs in New York City. Then we booked our first full tour. We would be opening for Public Enemy and Two Live Crew, two of the biggest hip-hop acts in the country at the time. We fed our luggage into the belly of the tour bus. My biological family ceremoniously presenting me unto my new hip-hop family. JL was the new father. He was the mature one. He was the adult in the room. He gave Mom Mom and Daddy O our itinerary, complete with bus routing, hotel names and phone numbers, venue addresses and dates, agents' names and contact info. JL was 21, going on 22. He was the oldest, and Mom Mom and Daddy O were relieved he was in charge. Omar was the youngest. He was only 16, and even at that age, his fashion sense was fire. He always had the hottest gear, and was the only person I've ever known who traveled with an iron. Most groups had at least two dancers for the symmetry, but Omar's leg surgery had been so effective that we only needed him. He and I had grown up about 10 doors from each other. He had been a witness to most of the major events of my life so far. He had seen me through Rayleigh choppers, cowboy boots, he'd bagged more than his share of ice. He'd even lied to me as I was being deposited into the back of the ambulance. Oh yeah man, definitely, you definitely dunked it. Omar wouldn't be graduating high school until next year. So JL had to walk up the street to his house to promise his mother that he would take responsibility for Omar getting his homework done and maintaining his honor roll status. Miss Brown, who had already played a key role in the naming of the Fresh Prince, had made this a condition of Omar being allowed to go on tour with us. Miss Rambert, you don't have to be concerned, JL said to Omar's mom. I graduated from Overbrook. Will graduated from Overbrook, and I give you my word, I will make sure that Omar graduates from Overbrook. Over the next year, JL helped Omar do his homework in hotel rooms, on tour buses, 
at rest stops, and they even missed our day at Six Flags over Georgia because of Pythagoras. Reddy Rock had stayed out partying the night before. He was exhausted. He threw his bags on the bus and was fast asleep in his bunk before we even pulled off. Jeff had just gotten brand new anvil cases to transport his turntables, records, and beatboxes. At the time, because of my excitement, I didn't notice, but Jeff was quiet and to himself that day. In subsequent years, he would confide in us that because of his sheltered childhood, every time we would have to leave Philly, he suffered extreme anxiety attacks and other physical reactions. He would have 30 to 40 minute vomiting spells, but for the longest time, he never said a word. We had all decided that if we were going to be traveling around to all of these strange towns and cities, it would be unwise to go without security. And in the early days of hip hop, security was defined as your biggest and tallest friend who didn't smile. Ours was Charles Alston, aka Charlie Mack. Charlie Mack was raised in South Philly, one of the rougher sections of town. His parents were separated and he lived with his mom. They moved a lot during his early childhood until the chaos of his home life pushed him into the streets. Charlie started hustling on the corners when he was just 11 years old. Not too long after, he graduated to gun toting and more serious drug dealing. By the time we met him, he was six foot seven, almost 300 pounds, and nobody messed with Charlie Mack. He showed up that day with a green trash bag full of ones and fives. Clearly the previous evening's revenues from his purveying of neighborhood pharmaceuticals. He had the trash bag slung over his shoulder like a ghetto Santa Claus. Charlie, you cannot walk around carrying a hefty bag full of cash, JL said. What you mean? What you mean? What you saying? I'm not going nowhere without my money, Charlie grumbled. Charlie's voice is way too deep, and he speaks way too fast to be nearly seven feet tall. And when he gets excited, he has no problem saying the same word or phrase as many times as necessary until you submit. My man, my man, my man, my man. And again and again. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. This will stop anybody in their tracks. The timber and speed of repetition are barely comprehensible, but magically induce compliance on the part of the listener. So we let him calm down. Me, Jeff, and JL spoke to him later. We talked about our dreams and what we all hoped to build together. We offered Charlie a choice. He could continue to be a drug dealer, or he could take this shot with us to build real lives. We couldn't pay him as much as he could make on the streets, but when we could, we promised we would. Charlie paused. I could tell he was weighing the whole of his life. He had dreams too, and in some deep hidden part of his soul, he knew he was living beneath himself. He had just needed someone to say it out loud. I think I can <coughs> with y'all, he said. He ultimately devoted his life to DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. It would prove to be a commitment that was not without twists and turns. But one thing was true from that day on, he never sold drugs again. Bags are finally loaded. Everyone has said their goodbyes. The posse is mounted. I hug my family and step into the tour bus door well. Three dirty rubber stairs, the threshold into my new life, a stargate, the portal out of my childhood and into the infinitely unknowable. On my own, where daddy -o could no longer hurt me, but he can no longer protect me either. Away from the shame of failing my mother, away from the fear in her eyes that seemed to say, he's ruining his life. As the doors began to close, I caught eyes with Gigi. She smiled that smile I'd seen in Resurrection Baptist Church every single Sunday of my life. 
Just remember, lover boy, she said. Be nice to everybody you pass on your way up, because you just might have to pass them again on your way down. The sun was setting as our bus rattled across the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Pennsylvania had turned into Delaware, Delaware had turned into Maryland, and the initial excitement had settled. The hum of the road lulled my heart into a reverie. The thought washed over me. I am in charge now. I had never been in love like I was with Melanie Parker. I wanted to build a life for us, to shield her from the chaos in the world. I wanted to do it right. From the time I was five years old, I always wanted to be married. I wanted my own family. Even my childhood games with my siblings. We used to play white family. Ellen was Kathy, Harry was Dicky, and I was Junior. Later, my fantasies as a teenager never involved having multiple girlfriends or wild orgies. My fantasies always involved one woman. I wanted to ravish her with my complete, undivided devotion and affection. I wanted to be the best man she's ever known. I wanted to fulfill all of her dreams, solve all of her problems, take away all of her pain. I wanted her to adore me. I wanted to be so trustworthy and emotionally reliable that I would cleanse her impression of all men. And if I could have killed a dragon for her, climbed up her hair, entered the heavily guarded castle, and then have my kiss work as an antidote to the poison she'd ingested, that would have just been a little icing on my love cake. I was 18. From the day I met her, Melanie had been the center of my life. Healing the pain of her trauma became my constant preoccupation. The look in Melanie's eyes became the substitute for Gigi's approval. I've always needed a woman to achieve for. When I performed, I was now performing for Melanie. When I started making money rapping, in my mind, I was making money for her. I bound my self-esteem to the sliding scale of her happiness. If she was happy, that meant I was a good person. If she was unhappy, that meant I was a monster. We arrived in Tallahassee on the first leg of our southern run. The rest of the guys would go to the venue early to set up and sound check, and because all I had to do was rap, I could arrive 45 minutes before showtime. On that first night, I walked into the dressing room to find the whole squad sitting around with six or seven girls. Jordache jeans and bamboo earrings everywhere. The dressing room smelled like the perfume section of a merry-go-round. I politely asked Keisha, Mercedes, and Cinnamon and them to leave, and I called a crew meeting. We gotta get these rules straight, I said. I don't want no girls in the dressing rooms, no girls on the bus, and whatever floor we're staying on in the hotel, I don't want no girls there either. I don't want to be smelling no perfume and hearing no giggling and- <coughs> I'm in love with Melanie. We're in a relationship and I am not out here for no foolishness. The guys all kind of looked at one another as if to say, he can't be serious. Reddy Rock raised his hand and I pointed to him. What man? Reddy Rock, somewhat confused, said, so where are we supposed to- <coughs> All the group he's at. Hopefully you'll be them behind that preposition, I said. Will, that's crazy, man, Charlie Mack said. You're not out here by yourself. This is all of us. How are you making lateral decisions? Look, man, I'm about to propose to this girl. We're getting married, and I am not messing it up because of a bunch of horny <coughs> ghetto hyenas. Big bro? I respect that you in love and all that, Omar said, but that don't make me no hyena. I was going full choir boy, and the guys didn't like it at all, but when my mind locks onto an idea, when I commit to a system of beliefs, there are only two options, one, I complete my mission, or two, I'm dead. We didn't know. 
we didn't realize you had to pay the bus driver yourself, and if you didn't, he might just go home. We didn't know that some venues would skim money off the top, that they'd lie to you about how many tickets they'd sold. We didn't know that unruly audiences would throw things at you on stage if they didn't like you. Pennies, bottles, batteries, shoes, and even an M80 explosive in Oakland one night. We didn't know that there were all kinds of curfew laws and union rules in different states that meant your show would get shut down if you didn't shut up and get off stage quick enough. We didn't know that you had to grease the security guys at the venue if you didn't want your stuff to come up missing. We didn't realize that one inch on a map could equal 12 hours on a tour bus. People often say ignorance is bliss. Maybe, right up until it's not. We punish ourselves for not knowing. We always complain about what we could and should have done, and how much of a mistake it was that we did that thing, that unforgivable thing. We beat on ourselves for being so stupid, regretting our choices, and lamenting the horrible decisions we make. But here's the reality. That's what life is. Living is the journey from not knowing to knowing from not understanding to understanding, from confusion to clarity. By universal design, you are born into a perplexing situation, bewildered, and you have one job as a human. Figure this out. Life is learning, period. Overcoming ignorance is the whole point of the journey. You're not supposed to know at the beginning. The whole point of venturing into uncertainty is to bring light to the darkness of our ignorance. I heard a great saying once, life is like school, with one key difference. In school you get the lesson and then you take the test, but in life you get the test and it's your job to take the lesson. We're all waiting until we have deep knowledge, wisdom and a sense of certainty before we venture forth. But we've got it backward. Venturing forth is how we gain the knowledge. Over the next few years, while our ignorance would rain down a deluge of pain and suffering, when I look back, I see clearly it could have been no other way. The universe only teaches through experience. So even when you haven't the slightest clue what you're doing, you just have to take a deep breath and get on the dang bus. You couldn't have found three more different groups to put on the same stage than DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, Public Enemy, and Two Live Crew. But hip hop was like that back then. I found myself studying the audience even more than the performers. We were all tapping into totally different aspects of the human spirit. Public Enemy would ignite social consciousness. People would stomp and yell and cheer venting their dissatisfaction with authority. I noticed how the security energy in the building, particularly in the South, would heighten as Chucky e. D riled the audience to rail against our shared sense of injustice. As part of their show, they had a stuntman dress up as a KKK member. They played out a scene in which he was sentenced for his crimes against humanity, and then in the most shocking moment of their entire show, they put a noose around his neck and hung him on stage. For 30 seconds, his body jerking and convulsing in midair while the crowd watched until his last shudder, and then silence, his lifeless body swinging above center stage, and then, yes, the rhythm, the rebel. Chuck D would drop into rebel without a pause as chaos and pandemonium was unleashed. And while I have experienced other performers who have matched the level of intensity Public Enemy could conjure, I have never seen it surpassed. Two live crew tapped into an entirely different kind of energy. Luther Campbell, aka Luke Skywalker or Uncle Luke, came out on stage and screamed to the crowd, Hey! and 15,000 people screamed, we want some <coughs> including the probably 8,000 women in attendance. I still haven't totally figured that one out. 
We had never heard of two live crew, yet in Florida, they were the headliner. Their hit single was called, We Want Some. <coughs> they were given the crowd permission to unleash, at least verbally, their inner hyenas. This was further amplified by the simulated lewd sex acts they included in their shows. And if I can keep it real, some nights they just skip the simulated part. But what really caught my attention was how smart everybody was. This was an era when authority, be it government, business, law enforcement, even many parents, was skeptical and fearful of the growing influence of hip-hop and hip-hop artists. Rap concerts were met with stringent scrutiny, particularly when we toured through southern states. When you're on tour with Public Enemy and two live crew in Georgia, South Carolina, Mississippi, and Alabama, rest assured your <coughs> was gonna get stringently scrutinized. Before the concerts in the South, there were always meetings with local sheriffs and chiefs of police to inform us of the local laws and statutes that governed the behavior that would be tolerated on stage. We were informed that any infringement would lead to an immediate ending of the show and we would be forcibly pulled off stage and arrested. Needless to say, both public fellatio and hanging clansmen were frowned upon in Mississippi. Given the high stakes, these meetings would inevitably escalate into social debate and legal interpretation. Chuck D knew the law. He had local advocates, community leaders, and legal scholars arming him with the counter-arguments and information necessary to defend his First Amendment rights. And when all else failed, he had bail money pre-organized. But what was not gonna happen was some local sheriff telling him he couldn't perform his show exactly the way he wanted to perform it. He hung a Klansman every single night of that tour. Luke Skywalker, on the other hand, wanted to get arrested. He saw it as supremely effective publicity. Uncle Luke was a brilliant entrepreneur. He owned his own record company, distributor, agency, and merchandising group not to mention barber shops, supermarkets, and nightclubs. He hadn't yet worked out how to expand his businesses beyond his regional foothold, but he knew that if he got arrested in Macon, Georgia, that Baton Rouge and Shreveport, Louisiana, would sell out within 24 hours of the headline. And on top of it, he'd had a perfectly lovely time on stage. He was also well aware of the growing national and international spotlight that was shining on the question of art versus morality. At the time, Tipper Gore, the then wife of the senator, Al Gore, was leading the charge against profanity in entertainment. Back then, FCC rules forbade broadcasting profanity, and 2 Live didn't have a single record that didn't have profanity in it. Even record store owners were getting arrested for crimes of obscenity for selling their albums. So Uncle Luke got a boat, built a radio station on it, and kept it offshore in international waters where he could legally broadcast back to the mainland. Luke saw two live crew being at the explosive center of this battle, and he aimed to harness this fuel to expand his business globally. Eventually. The U.S. Court of Appeals ruled that rap was protected by the First Amendment. More than 20 years later, Luther Campbell ended up running for mayor of Miami-Dade County. I remember sitting in those meetings, wanting to raise my hand so bad and say, Excuse me, Mr. Sheriff Officer Sir, you don't need to look at me, because my grandmother agrees with you. But honestly, you can probably just arrest them right now, cause Chuck is definitely gonna hang a Klansman tonight, and Luke never gets past the first chorus before his balls are all the way out. Now our show, Mr. Officer Sir, is good, wholesome family fun. Jeff is the best DJ on earth, Ready Rock C can make the theme from Sanford and Son sound like it's underwater. Omar couldn't even walk till he was six, 
but now he's the best dang dancer since. Who might you know? Who's a good white dancer? Fred Astaire. And if there was ever a black kid you wanted your daughter, Becky Sue, to bring home, I promise you it's me. You won't have no problems out of us. Are we free to go now? I don't remember JL speaking once in any of those meetings. Instead, he filled legal pads with notes. He studied every single word. He later went back to research the statutes. He met with Public Enemies managers, made friends with tour promoters, picked Luke Skywalker's brain about major labels versus self-distribution. JL spent less and less time going with us sightseeing to clubs or to amusement parks and more and more time studying the music business from any and every angle. Touring had opened our eyes to the industry and the intricacies of how it actually worked. Public Enemy had a management company, accountants, A&R reps, and road managers. We just had JL. Word Up Records, Dana's record label, still didn't have any other artists signed to it. Dana didn't tell us how many records we sold. Our record still wasn't available in any stores outside of Philly. But the breaking point for me happened when we found out that Dana had not been returning calls from Russell Simmons. Back then, Russell was arguably the single most important person in the hip-hop world. He had been representing artists and producing records since 1977. He co-founded Def Jam Records, the biggest hip-hop label in the 80s. And he had groomed, managed, and produced all of the biggest acts, such as the Beastie Boys, Run DMC, LL Cool J, and Houdini. Apparently, Russell had been trying to contact us for months already, but none of his messages were getting to us because he was trying to reach us through Dana. We were pissed. Russell absolutely loved DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. He was raving about the first line of Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble, where I say, Oh, my eye, my eye. Man, this guy just walked up to me and punched me in my eye, man. Talking about how I was just trying to talk to his girl, man. I don't even know her, man. That's the illest <coughs> I've ever heard, Russell said. What rapper admits they got punched in the eye? Russell recognized our honesty, vulnerability, and self-deprecating humor, unheard of in hip-hop at the time, as a passport to places rappers had never gone. Russell wanted to work with us. Unfortunately, Dana refused to talk to him. I've always marveled at JL's and Dana's opposite reactions to Russell's enthusiasm. Whereas Dana was threatened by Russell's interest, JL saw Russ as a potential teacher and a gateway to new opportunities. And JL had a plan. Even though Dana controlled the recording of our music, JL controlled the management of our career. He agreed to turn over the management of DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince to Russell Simmons and Lyar Cohen at Rush Management under three conditions. One, they would put Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince on tour with their biggest artists. Two, they would hire JL to oversee our account. And three, they would teach JL the business. Russell agreed. It is so painful when people I care about miss the opportunity to elevate. I've been in this kind of situation maybe 50 times in my career. I'm trying to climb and fly as high as humanly possible, and I want to take the people I love with me. But invariably, at critical moments, when the necessity to level up presents itself, some people like JL rise to the occasion and others fold. Whether they don't see the grander vision, or can't take the heat of the fresh challenge, or they're trapped by some hidden, self-defeating narrative, over and over I have suffered the pain of waving from the bow of the new ship as they're left behind, standing on the shore. You've gotta get us out of this Dana deal, I said to JL. 
It doesn't work like that, JL said. So he can just hold us back and there's nothing we can do? Doesn't he have some legal responsibility? He has a contract, JL said. You just make the records. Let me figure this out. Hip hop was now a global business and DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince were primed to be packaged and sold to the world. We needed national and global distribution. Jive Records was based out of London. Jive would later become famous for masterminding the careers of Britney Spears, NSYNC, and Backstreet Boys, but back in the 80s they were the biggest hip-hop label in Europe. With Dana controlling our record in the United States, JL orchestrated an international distribution deal with Jive to sell Rock the House overseas. Jive hired Dana's Word Up Records to be the official distributor of DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince in the United States. On the surface, this appeared to be an easy win for Dana. He'd get to keep selling our records in the States while we'd gain a bigger profile worldwide and go into the studio on Jive's dime. Basically, Jive would cover all the costs, but Dana would still get a revenue stream at home. Dana couldn't wait to sign that contract. Dana got a big check and sold our international rights to Jive. Jive immediately remastered and re-released Rock the House in March 1987 with a new cover and a new burst of energy and it became a significant global hit. They were also able to sell this new version as an import in the United States. Dana realized that he had opted for a one-time payment instead of a royalty and he could do nothing about the imports. So he demanded more money and threatened to refuse all cooperation with Jive. A legal battle ensued. And as soon as the lawyer started digging into our paperwork, they figured out that I had been 17 when I signed the contract with Dana. Under Pennsylvania law, anyone under the age of 18 cannot legally sign a contract without a parent or guardian present. I had signed mine in the lobby of a studio before a recording session, therefore, in legal terms, our contract with Dana never existed. Just like that, Dana Goodman was out of the DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince business. Dana was furious. At first he blamed Jive and Russell Simmons, but lacking the lawyers and money to go after them, he decided to exact revenge on the next best thing. Me. People in the neighborhood started pulling me up. Hey man, Dana's really upset. Just watch your back. Then, one night, he pulled up outside our house, parked his car on the street, and just sat there. I was terrified, but Daddy-O never flinched. Not saying a word, he opened the front door, walked up to Dana's car, and leaned down into the open passenger side window. Daddy-O saw a gun on the dashboard. Can I help you? Daddy-O said. Where's that mother at? Dana gruffly responded. Well, if the mother you're looking for is Will, he's in the house. You're welcome to come in and kill him now. And the whole family's home too. Cause if you touch Will, you gonna have to kill us all. But we ain't accepting no threats from you. Daddy-O immediately turned his back on a man who could have easily have shot him and strolled into the house. I'm not sure if it was his military training or his upbringing on the streets of North Philly, but he taught me a valuable lesson that day. It's better to die than to walk around scared. I was in the living room, peeking from behind the curtain. I watched as Dana put his car in drive and drove away.